second hour of this time, but let me just uh, say a few of those words again and maybe expand a little bit. It's probably been a couple of years now. I think it maybe our first communication preceded COVID, I want to say. And um, I do back and forth emails before we finally sat down to coffee across the street at the coffee shop. It used to be Anna's over there. And um, it was my pleasure and it was really just set something in motion that I'm very, continue to be very excited about. I mean, Dennis Cullinan, who's the executive director and co-founder of the Witness Stone Project. Um, I've talked about it before. Um, I wrote my Cornerstone article about it in the last newsletter. So I think many of you have heard some of this, so I don't want to go into all the details. Um, but the Witness Stone Project places small memorial stones honoring enslaved people from towns across Connecticut, and I believe now you're in Massachusetts and New Jersey as well, uh, to honor and remember and uh, memorialize the contribution that enslaved people made um, in our communities. There's uh, so, so, so. We at First Church began engaging this conversation, uh, decided that, well, we found out a couple of things, that there were a couple of enslaved people in Simsbury who had connections to this church, one enslaved by a former minister and another enslaved by a prominent member here named Andrew Roby. And so um, we decided that this was a, a good thing for us to educate ourselves and be part of this civic fabric here in Simsbury to have a stone place here. And so the trustees, I believe, have approved that now. Um, there's a place just outside the parish hall here that I think has been identified uh, to, to, to be determined, still, still to be determined. But, um, but come June 4th or 5th, whatever the Sunday is, Pentecost, um, 5th, thank you. Um, the, the, I don't know what Dennis is talking about, so I don't want to take all this stuff. There's a component of this that middle school students prepare research, educate, and then, and then make presentations about the enslaved person in our town. And so there's middle school students at Henry James Middle School that are hard at work doing that. So they will be here on June 5th in worship, sharing some of what they learned about Peter Cesar, the enslaved person that we will be remembering. Uh, and then we will go dedicate the stone wherever it lands. Um, we will be going there and dedicating it. So I just want to say too, Dennis will, explain all that much better than, than I could, I'm sure. But I want to say two more things about Dennis. Um, I realized when I was talking to him that this um, is his call, is what we would call it in the church. I think I named that, and he said, it's my life's work. So he, he um, had a vision. He uh, saw something, and he's committed to um, his life to these witness stones. And that always touches me. That always moves me. I always feel... Uh, I'm very much in touch with that language of call, being a minister, and so I want to affirm that in um, you, Dennis. There's also a group in the church that's uh, meeting to discuss uh, church growth. And one of the things we're talking about is a short, concise, powerful mission statement for the church. One that we can all remember and just repeat back on command. And uh, the Witness Stone Project has such a mission statement. So I will read that, and then I will welcome you. Uh, Dennis to come forward. Through research, education, and civic engagement, the Witness Stones Project Incorporated seeks to restore the history and honor the humanity of the enslaved individuals who helped build our communities. So um, that says it right there. And uh, I will just uh, stop talking and invite you up, Dennis. So thank you for being here. Well, it's very nice to be here today. Um, I've been taking trips to Simsbury now a few times to meet with teachers and, and Pastor George. And um, it's it's really nice. I have a lot in common with the town I live in, Guilford, uh, where it's a, it's a very nice community. But um, we'll say we don't always see all the signs of the past. Where in Guilford, the um, uh, population of and slave people was about 3% or Africans were about 3% during the time of slavery. 
probably less than one percent today. So we see that across Connecticut. And but there's a lot of communities that are now open to understanding that past and, and embracing it. So um, thank you so much. And you know, I started this as a middle school teacher. I was um, I taught um, middle school eighth grade U.S. history for about a uh, quarter of a century. And while I was teaching that, when my kids got old enough that they didn't need me driving them to practice and things, I started going to the local library and looking for things. And I was hooked on the story of Harriet Beecher Stowe, whose mother and father grew up in Guilford, and who lived there for a while after her mother, Roxanna Foote Beecher, died in Litchfield. So she came back to live with her maternal grandmother and aunts. And um, as I was looking at her story and reading about what she and her father said about Guilford, I stumbled upon um, Harvey the Bound Boy's Black Diamond. And, and I didn't know who they were. Who were these African Americans or people of African descent living in the household of Harry Beecher Stowe's grandmother? Who, who were they and why were they there? And, and what does that have to do with the history of, of, of Guilford, of Connecticut, of Lincoln? And um, soon after, I went to the town historian and I said, Joel, what am I seeing here? And he said, You're, you're seeing slavery. And I said, where else, where else could I see that? So he sent me out to find the threads, the, the strings of yarn that you could weave together to tell the story. And within a few years, I was able to tell the story of um, a little bit of the story of slavery in Guilford, Connecticut, and Madison, Connecticut. And then giving a talk like this at the library uh, back in the um, winter of 2017, a friend of mine, Doug Nygren, who was a family counselor, also was fluent in German, would go back to Germany and help them deal with the issues surrounding the Holocaust. And he went to Germany and saw the Strucklestein, the stumbling stones that are installed there, where Jews lived freely before they were kidnapped and murdered during the Holocaust. And he came back and said, could we remember enslaved people the same way? And, and my joke is always you, um, talk to a surgeon about a sore knee, he's gonna to want to operate. You talk to a teacher about a, about something and they're gonna to want to make it an educational unit. So within a couple of weeks, I, I had understood how I could bring my documents to the classroom to have kids extract the information to tell the story of enslaved people. And then we went back to the Germans and said, would you mind if we were inspired by you? And they said, no, we understand. It's not the same. The Holocaust and transatlantic slavery, slavery is not the same, but it's similar enough that they were happy that they were inspiring our work. And then we got started. Um, so that's that's how the project started. But you know, when I teach teachers and I teach people in Connecticut, I, I like to take a, a little bit of a step back. Might have to point it towards. You want to point it towards the machinery over there? Um, on yeah, probably. I think I'm going to need my lovely assistant. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I saw this on the floor the other day. I'm thinking, my dog got a hold of it. Anyway, uh, so using my high school French, um, you know, New England, the Red Home it's reason to be, was uh, certainly we had pastors who came here and they were, they were, um, we will say that they, you know, they were. Um, not as much the centers as separatists. They wanted to have a separate church in the Church of England. The Church of England looked a little too Catholic to the Puritans. And so they wanted a separate church. Well, that's part of the history of New England. But people came here to settle, to make money. This was a business proposition. The town of Guilford was called a plantation. It was the Plymouth Plantation. The plantation was a place where people were going to make money. How were they going to make money? Well, certainly part of that making money was creating things here, growing things here, uh, manufacturing things here, and sending it to the West Indies. The sugar plantations were such a big part of the early New England trade all the way up through to the American Revolution and even after that, um, that people here were filling vessels, like, you know, like driving by the canal coming up here, getting things to the Connecticut River, getting things to the Long Island Sound, getting things to the uh, Atlantic Ocean, shipping them to the West Indies. 
And part of that trade was also ships coming from New England, especially Newport and Bristol, Rhode Island, but also New London and Boston, and going to Africa and trading our manufactured goods, our rum, our things for enslaved people to bring to the West Indies to produce more crops at a surplus. Um, if you have gone to the West Indies or you have friends who cook, um, you know, Puerto Rican, uh, or, uh, Cuban, or other, or other dishes from there, you'll find bacalao is one of the most popular dishes, dry cod fish. Why are people in the West Indies eating fish from the North Atlantic? Because it was cheaper for them to buy fish from us to feed their enslaved people than it was for them to take their enslaved or take anyone and go fishing there. They were making such a profit raising sugarcane that it didn't make much sense for them to <coughs> do other things. So that caused us, you know, West, uh, West, <coughs> Weathersfield was famous for its red onions. Much of Connecticut was famous for its horses, barrel staves and, uh, and beef in the barrel and beef on the hoof were all things that we were sending to the West Indies. Um, some of the books that I used in, in my research, and I have many, many more than this, complicity that was written in the two, I think around 2005, 2006, uh, by three journalists from the Hartford Current is a fantastic book about slavery and about Connecticut's complicity with slavery and how pretty much every, how slavery floated all boats. It's not the enslaved people in your communities, enslaved people uh, in other places where we were making money from early on from the West Indies, later on from the American South. Um, slavery before race is something I look at. Um, Eastern uh, Long Island was part of Connecticut for a while. And if you go down to Sylvester, uh, Sylvester Manor on Shelter Island, you find uh, both indigenous and African slavery being interpreted there. And this, this book was a pretty good example of, of how you can look at the person who wrote it was an archaeologist, but she used archaeology and history, historical documents to tell the story there. And a book that came out recently, uh, like Crispy Clark from Jara, is about Rhode Island and slavery. And that's a very good book for us to understand a little bit how slavery was uh, was different in each different uh, colony at the time and state. But Newport, Rhode Island, Bristol, Rhode Island, before Newport was famous for where all the industrialists had their big homes, it was famous for uh, being the center of the slave trade in, in the United States. They would go straight out, taking stuff from New England and shipping it to, the, to Africa and taking the enslaved people in Africa and shipping them to the West Indies and bringing some of the ones that they didn't sell in the West Indies here. So, now this is a specific example. I told you I kind of got um, hooked on, you know, Harry Beecher Stowe's family. Well, her grandfather, Eli Foote, lived in Guilford. He was a loyalist during the American Revolution, and he was a pretty popular lawyer before the revolution, but he couldn't go back to lawyering because of his politics. So he got into the merchant, uh, got into the trade. And this is an example of him purchasing things on consignment from different residents of Guilford, Connecticut, and putting them on a vessel. It says, you read the top sloop, uh, Juno, and Eli Foote. <laughs> And, and shipping them down to the West Indies. Now, they didn't go to one port and, and offload everything. They would go into one port and sell what they could and buy what they could and go to the next port. So think of that Yankee trader that happened later on in early America that would go down to the south and with a wagon full of stuff and you go to each community and sell what you have. Well, they would do that with ships. And, uh, and you can see lots of barrel stays, horses, you know, beef on the hook I was telling you before, beef in the barrel. Uh, tallow, which was both uh, for candle making and a lubricant. They also have gallons of rum, some for the crew, so I guess that's a lubricant too to get to, <laughs> to work. So, so they would bring rum with them, and they weren't really selling rum to the West Indies, although the West Indies wasn't making as much rum then than as they did later because we had the distillers and we were taking the sugar and the molasses and, and, and processing it, and making a profit from that. Um, go to the next slide, please. And this is what it looks like uh, when you transcribe everything. I got, I guess, maybe training as reading uh, eighth grade handwriting helped me prepare for, <laughs> for transcribing. Although, you know, teachers today, most of the kids are submitting everything typewritten, but many years of reading kids' handwriting, I got pretty good at transcribing. But you can see, like, John Leeds' oxen or um, Silas Benson's oxen, or talks about specific items that he has there that it looks like he's buying for a price and selling for whatever he can get for it, 
and that's how we made a profit. Um, and it's a, you know, it, this is an example. This was from the Harry Beecher Stowe Center up in Hartford. They have all the foot stuff from uh, Harry Beecher Stowe's mother's side of the family. So it's a, it's a treasure trove of, of historical documents. And this is from uh, um, Dr. Uh, Eric Bartholomew Kimball, who wrote his uh, thesis on looking, taking a snapshot, four-year snapshot of the British customs reports from different ports throughout uh, the East Coast of the United States. And this is for um, New London and, and New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, Professor Matt Washauer first used this, so I said, I'm gonna steal your stuff. And he said, go ahead. Uh, so I stole it. I, I made my own slide, but I found the source and I went and looked at it. So you can see three out of every four horses in the West Indies came from Connecticut, tens of thousands of horses from Connecticut. Uh, horses were 59% of the value of all goods going to Connecticut, and they worked in the mills. They would be the thing that would, uh, the mills that would crush the sugar cane to make the sap to, or uh, the sugar juice to make, or the cane juice to distill or to um, evaporate to make sugar and molasses. 27,000 sheep for dung and food, uh, four and a half million pounds of beef and pork. Now again, think about pork. What do you need? You know, what, how do you how do you sell pork? Well, you probably have to smoke it or or preserve it, like we do with hams and bacon and things like that. Uh, beef the same way. You know, we just recently celebrated a, a holiday, St. Patrick's Day, with corned beef. Well, corned beef is a way of preserving beef. So you had fresh beef and you salt the living daylights out of it. You could sell it uh, later. Other products, butter. Butter and cheese are two ways of preserving milk. If you think of all the cows and cattle we had here, you couldn't drink all that milk in a day uh, before it would spoil. We didn't have refrigerators, so what did you do? You turned it immediately. A lot of houses had a, uh, either a buttery or a place within the house where they would turn that fresh milk into something that could be preserved. So we're sending those things to the West Indies. And 74,000 or 75,000 pounds of tallow over a four year period. And when I would explain to the kids, they'd say, what's tallow? I said, well, if your mom ever made a pot roast, then put the leftovers in the fridge, that hard white fat that kind of sits on the top of it is pretty much what tallow is. Um, and that, that can be preserved. And, you can, and that's a way of preserving both calories and something, like I said, candles are really, uh, tallow candles were something that was used often. I guess the houses would smell pretty good too. <laughs> What did we buy from the West Indies? Um, about a million and a half pounds of brown sugar, over half a million gallons of molasses, some rum. We bought some rum, but not as much as you would think. Uh, but again, the rum industry down there occurred later. And then salt. Why did we need all that salt? Well, Long Island Sound wasn't good at making salt. The water was brackish. And we needed salt to make the hams and to salt the beef and to dry the codfish and things like that. Now, Connecticut wasn't as big as sending codfish and stuff to the West Indies. That was kind of out of Boston. And if you go to Faneuil Hall today, you see the top of Faneuil Hall is a codfish. So that was, that was part of their industry. Uh, imports in the West Indies, 47% of all ships to New Haven and 54% of all tonnage. Over half the stuff into New Haven was coming out of the West Indies. So when we say the West Indies was part of our economy, it was the largest single part of our economy. New London, a little less, but of course you remember New London is closer to uh, the open ocean. So if you're gonna ship things to Boston or ship things to uh, Europe, you can do that. We were also trading a lot with, they call them the wine, wine islands, um, kind of like where, you know, Madeira and, and some of the islands off the coast of Spain were some of the places we were trading with. We did a lot of trade, some other folks I found, we did a lot of trade with Ireland. We would bring them flat seats and they would make linen. Because Ireland during the time when it was colonized couldn't export everything it wanted to to the United States. They had to export most of their stuff to uh, England, but they were exporting a lot of, uh, of linen. Uh, next slide, please. So we can, you know, I'm trying to prove the case that we were, you know, we say it's not just the people on the coast, but people inland cutting down their trees, making barrel stage. People were, you know, drying peas and putting them in barrels. All these roads that led to the um, the river or led to Hartford. I'm I'm working in in you know, like western or north northeastern uh, Connecticut, 
Some of the roads led to Boston, some led to Hartford. On, on Woodstock, you can see the direction that some roads led to Norwich. How do we get things to port? That's what people are doing. The argument that we were an agricultural society and we were selling hay to each other, and that's why we have these big houses, doesn't hold up. There was, you know, day one, we were at subsistence farming. Day two, we were killing ships. And that's kind of the story of New England. Second part of the story is that before we had African slavery, we had indigenous slavery. We had um, ways of, you know, through the Pequot War and the King Phillips War, it gave us the right to enslave people. And oftentimes the male uh, Indians were sent to the West Indies and traded for black slaves. And sometimes uh, the women were, were sold into captivity. Now, indigenous people, tribal members were not supposed to be held captive for their life. They were supposed to have a term to their captivity because they were subjects of the crown. But I have an example I'll show you later where a man was purchased at 25 years old and had an 80 year indenture. So he was, you know, the law, he meant the letter of the law, but certainly not the spirit of the law. And um, Governor Lee was the last governor of New Haven Colony and the second governor of the combined Connecticut New Haven Colony. And he uses some interesting language. It's hard to decipher, but I'll just say if you've been to your local history books and it talks about servant, if it's before 1784, servant pretty much means slave. And so we have to kind of, you know, break that idea that, oh, they had some nice, the Phelps had some servants while well, they had slaves. And that it means something different. We have to kind of break through that. But it says we have hired some Mohican Indians. So that sounds like they were, they were hired regularly. Uh, and that other Indians do live as servants unto me for planting corn, cutting wood this winter and next summer. Now, the other Indians could be Pequot Indians, because Pequot Indians, after the Pequot War, you couldn't call them Pequots, and they were sent to other tri tribal nations to be enslaved. So the Mohegans and the Narragansetts took in uh, Pequot women as, as slaves after the uh, Pequot Wars. You know, the King Phillips War, did that happen? I don't know if anyone knows the history of this area. I think it made it some of its way here. Uh, in uh, certainly in Eastern Massachusetts, in uh, Northeastern Connecticut, and um, in places like Brookfield and Brimfield and Deerfield and things like that. But those indigenous people were also uh, held in captivity after that war. Um, and then oftentimes there was debt servitude. So if an Indian got uh, into debt or they had trouble with the law, two things would happen. Oftentimes they would have to pay their debts through selling their land. And, or they had to pay their debts through servitude. So we see that happening with indigenous people too. You know, evidence of slavery in church records, um, not that the church has <laughs> sent their stuff to the state library in the 1930s, but those who did, uh, they had their records indexed. And if you go on the left here, this is for East Haven, Connecticut. This is a chief that researchers do. If you go to the end of the records, this is an index you find online on Ancestry or at the State Library, and where you find no surnames, people without last names, that's where you find enslaved people listed. So there's a whole page of enslaved people who were held in captivity in East Haven, uh, East Haven Connecticut. On the right, we see a different example. This is for the uh, Greenwich Vital Record, very similar, where items in the Vital Records were extracted out and alphabetize. But in Greenwich, the enslaved people often took on the last name of their enslavers. So we could see the top one is Cole Jr., who had been enslaved. His last name now is Bush. So he's listed as everyone else in that family. But then you have David, and it says David had Negroes, Phyllis and Patience, Millie, daughter of Patience, uh, Rose, daughter of Patience, and this whole family. So we can see the family that was held in captivity by David Bush is all listed under Bush. Other records, you might find it in the back. So, and then the hardest thing to find is when, a, when an enslaved person gains their freedom, sometimes they take on a new last name. And so when you're looking for something in the records, they disappear. Um, although there's certain last names, I mean, certain first names that were very specific, well, not 100% of the time, but specific to enslaved people like a Caesar or a Pompey or a Cato, the, these uh, old biblical or 
Greek or Roman names, you would tend to find more among the uh, enslaved people or the children. So, you know, sometimes their children, when they were free, they gave those names too. Uh, go ahead. Colonial census of uh, Connecticut. Um, this is 1774. This is kind of the high tide of slavery that we have records of in Connecticut. So if we look here under Simsbury, there are no indigenous people listed. And we can see there are 29 uh, and people of color or black people, but we don't, or Negro people is that way the term they use, but we don't know if they were all enslaved. We would guess that the majority of them were enslaved. But this is the high tide. This is before the American Revolution and, um, and after the big importation of, of uh, people from Africa during the early uh, 1700s and mid 1700s. Connecticut stopped the importation of enslaved people from Africa, I think by 1780. And then by 1784, they began to, they call it gradual uh, emancipation. They, any child born to a enslaved woman after May, uh, March 1st, 1784, uh, 1784, would gain their freedom at 25 years old. So, um, but think of a woman who was born in 1783 would be having children for the could be having children you know starting so many years for 40 years from there and then her children be be you know so we it didn't stop slavery and slavery ended up ending in connecticut in 1848 it ended completely in connecticut in 1848 so the law um we'll just say that our um although the spirit of the law was to free more people the actual thing that happened with the law was to protect the property owners. So Connecticut's very good about protecting property owners. That's why we're having crazy arguments about zoning right now, aren't we? <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not, the question is do the right thing or protect the property owner. And uh, it's a hard, it's a hard uh, struggle. But we can see um, Hartford County was bigger then. So I think there's towns there that aren't in Hartford County today. Um, and there's towns missing, right? Because like the Grandies are not there. The Grandies, I think were, I think Simsbury included the Grand, both Grandies, which is, if you look at the territory of Simsbury and both Grandies, it was a, it was a big, it was a really big town. So this is um, the same census in uh, New Haven County. And you can see, um, some towns, they counted the indigenous people. Other towns, there may not have been many people who were counted as indigenous people. And we believe that some people were left uncounted. And whether that was on purpose or not, we can't say. The sad thing is the first, the first, uh, uh, the US census, which started in 1790, did not count indigenous people or Indians until I think 1860. So they kind of disappear or they can disappear from the record that goes along with the story of their, you know, the last of, which we know isn't true. You know, my, uh, my niece found out who her biological father was and she goes, I'm Nipmuc. I'm like, well, <laughs> and, and the, in the history books is the last of the Nipmuc. She goes, no, we're here, you know, we're, and that's and for many tribal groups that are, they're here. Uh, we just don't identify the, the trick, not the trick, but if somebody was part Indian, they would try to diminish that because that would take away their rights to their reservation to their property. If somebody was part black, they would try to maximize it because that allowed you to, you couldn't enslave somebody who was white, but you could enslave somebody who was mixed race. So it, it, it was a difference where if somebody's part African-American, that would be maximized. If somebody was part indigenous, that would be minimized. Uh, a lot to do with the property rights and things like that. Well, So you see, I'm going to keep swinging back to Harry Gucci-Stowe's family. But uh, Lyman Beecher was, he did his autobiography uh, before his death. And his autobiography was a mixture of interviews by his children and letters he wrote and maybe some of his sermons. So it's really an interesting, it's still out there. You can find copies of it. It's certainly online. But Harry Beach still was interviewing her father about slaves in North Guilford about the time of the revolution. He said, were there not some who held slaves then? Because he just mentioned that 
if his family owned slaves, they would have they would have been busted. They would have not been able to pay the taxes because during the revolution, taxes were pretty high to, 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 to uh, feed the troops, and, and a tax might be a half of a, a half a steer or something like that. It might the, the taxes might be in bushels of corn or or uh, barrels of beef or things like that. And so Lyman responds, yes, if you, Darb the Fiddler was a slave, belonged to old Mr. Ben Rossiter. Darb came in one evening, played dancing tunes when I was a bed. There were about a dozen slaves in North Guilford was slave. It was very lenient. And of course, we'll put a, I should put an asterisk there because lenient to somebody who can, whose children can be bought and sold might have a different meaning. Um, he went on to say, old priest Fowler Moses was quite the man of business. So Moses sent Johnny Fowler to college, paid the bills, managed the farm, rung the church bell, and was factotum. He lived a slave because he was king. So when I first read that, when I was doing early on in my research and, and my discovery, I'm like, what was slavery like in Connecticut if Moses was a person? If, Mo if this is true about Moses, that he paid for his enslaver's son to go to Yale, rang the church bell, kept the books, ran the farm, was a fact totem, which I had to look up, which is a jack of all trades, and was a king. What, what, is, what was slavery like? But these are all things that happened within Connecticut. And, and what we'd say to the kids is that within the institution of slavery, within the confines of slavery, Moses was a pretty, pretty special person. And, and um, but we can look at that because slavery in the North was less of this gang labor where you would line people up and have somebody behind them with a whip and keep them going. More like, um, you, you know, Moses, you have to go out and mow that field. That's your job today. When you're done, you could come back and do something else. So it looks like Moses always was had side gigs. He was doing things on the side so much so that it was able to accumulate wealth. He was able to understand things like paying the bills. And his community of enslaved people felt so much, you know, they honored him so much, they wanted him to be the, the decision maker among that community. Now there's controversy about what a slave king was and some people say, well, it's just a way for, you know, the, the white enslavers to uh, control the enslaved people. But I think it was also a way for the African-American community to have somebody within their own community make decisions. So if somebody, an African-American man stole from another person, somebody not the, magistrate, the white magistrate who might have that person whipped or, or beaten, not that person not making a decision, but somebody within that community was making a decision on how, the, what the recompense should be or what the punishment should be. So these are things that, you know, we're still working on discovering. Slave kings and slave governors was kind of unique to Connecticut and a little bit Massachusetts and parts of Rhode Island. It does kind of seem to resemble the, uh, what might be in a West African community where you have a, each community might have its own cheaper thing. So these are things, you know, I, I haven't been able to get too much into it, but I'm certainly impressed that Moses has that, you know, would gain that status. And we have other people around Connecticut stories that we could tell about slave kings and governors. Uh, how do we remember the enslaved people today? You know, it's hard to find evidence of enslaved people. In Guilford, out of all the enslaved people, you know, I have names of about 85. I would guess the number three or four times more. We have two extant gravestones of grave markers. They're both from men named Shem, one who fought in the French and Indian War, and the other, we believe, fought in the American Revolution. They're in separate parts of the gravestone. One's associated with, with a <coughs> Captain Dudley, and the other one's uh, associated with the Deacon Sidney and Chip. And so that's, that's all we can find of all the extant gravestones we have from that time period in Guilford, we can find two. Certainly there's other people who we don't have gravestones for. And we don't, we're, not, we're not ignoring the fact that there were poor people uh, <laughs> who don't have gravestones and widows whose husbands died so much earlier. Uh, people in the poor house didn't have gravestones, but it is kind of interesting that we don't remember them the same way. On the upper right-hand corner, if anyone, I, uh, if anyone saw my talk last, uh, this past week, with the Greenwich Historical Society, we could see that um, Hester Mead and Candace Bush, that was the same Bush family from the Bush Holly House, that Hester Mead, when she died, she had accumulated enough wealth to leave money to her, 
descendants and, and get a gravestone for herself and her mother. So we find in a, it's called the Union Cemetery that was established like in 1860 something in Greenwich, we find Hester being buried next to her mother, which is really kind of cool. Uh, place names that are changed. You know, in Guilford, we have uh, lower right, left hand corner, North Street used to be N word lane. Well, they changed it to North Street. That's good. We don't want to call it N word lane, but we also do want to somehow remember that, that African uh, free blacks lived on that street. So how do we balance that off? Sometimes we do it by taking a name off, which is kind of a little bit of erasure because you won't remember that there are people of color living there unless you really go back in the books. Um, the next example, Walker Pond, is a little bit better, where the, the pond had, had a name that was derogatory towards African Americans, and they changed the name to name it after the first black minister in, in Milford. So they, to me, that's a way of changing something, but not erasing who was there. <clears throat> the treatment of enslaved in the North, as told by you know, Lyman Beaches and other, others, lenient with many freedoms, paternalistic with masters guiding morals of slaves. Treatment as part of the family care for life. According to slave narratives, this is what African-Americans wrote about slavery. Benjamin Smith is the most famous uh, narrative we have here in Connecticut, James Mars, Jeffrey Brace. And we have the stories written by Jeremiah Asher, who was a preacher. Um, he was a Presbyterian preacher, and he wrote about his grandfather's uh, capture and arrival to Connecticut, his life and his uh, serving in the American Revolution and things that happened. So we read these four um, stories, they talk about whippings, beatings, and hog times, double crossings and cheatings, abandonment of agent, agent, youth sold south, severe punishments for minor crimes. This is what they're saying happened in Connecticut. So we have to take, I think it's really worthwhile to take their word for what happened and really start looking at the documents that support what is really going on. So when we look at, um, I'll give you an example, Harry Beecher Stowe's family, when, when uh, Lyman Beecher and Roxanna Foote married in Guilford, they went to uh, East Hampton, Long Island. They went to the Presbyterian Church because there was no Congregationalists there, and I guess that was the next best thing. And that was his first, what do you, what do you call it? Uh, call. Yeah, it was his first or, or ordained, you know, he was ordained by that church because he graduated from Yale. They get down there, and after Mrs. Foote had her second child, they knew that she wanted to get help because she wanted to she, she, was, she was teaching some of the uh, local girls French and things like that. And so she wanted help. So the, they went out and procured two black girls, Rachel and Drusilla, who were five years old. Mm. Now they were free blacks, they were free, and they were bound out to Lyman Beecher and Roxanna Foote at five years old to take care of the, foot, the, the Beecher children, okay? Which I, I, have, a, I have a six year old granddaughter, I'm like, <laughs> when she grab, when she holds her son, or when she holds my grandson for like a half a minute, I'm like hovering over her. I'm like, okay, but the worst thing is when Lyman Beecher and Roxanna Foote left to his, get his next job in, in Litchfield, Connecticut, they brought these two girls with them. So these girls are now taken away from everybody else they know, from their family, from their brothers and sisters, their mother and father, their aunts and uncles, everybody, and brought up to Litchfield, Connecticut. And of course, Harriet Beecher still writes in Uncle Tom's Cabin how awful it was to separate <laughs> children from their mothers. And what did her parents do? They did the same thing, right? So that's, but that's the, that's the idea where, you know, if you read about that part of, in, in Lyman Beecher's autobiography, it's like, oh, just a normal thing. We're bringing these, our, our servants with us. But then her, his daughter writes a story about how awful it is to separate children from their so we have to really, and sometimes we use the term reading against the grain, where we read something, grab the information out of it that's pertinent, but don't take their interpretation of it. You have to take your own interpretation of it. Okay. Um, there's lots of examples, and literally and figuratively, I could be here all day. Uh, but we can see there's lots of examples. Uh, we have you know, Lyman Beach's autobiography. We have anecdotes. If you have anecdotes written, you all have a wonderful booklet 
um, that was written by a, 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 a graduate student, a lot li a library of library science, who writes about African Americans and, and some enslaved people here at Sigur. A wonderful document. That person spent a good part of you know a few years gathering the information. That's a, such a great starting point for this project or anyone else who wants to understand the African American experience, early African American experience of slavery in in, in Greenwich. This fellow named Jeffrey Bingham Mee, who's got this great backstory because he's related to the Binghams, who uh, the ministers who went to Hawaii <laughs> and settled Hawaii and uh, converted the people. And good story, bad story, depending on point of view. But he went in to the records and pulled out all the emancipation because in Connecticut there was another law after seven after the 1784 law. There was a 1792 law that said if you're holding somebody in captivity and they're between 25 and 45, and they're of good health, and you get them to pass kind of a physical, and they want to be freed, and they'll, they make a statement that they want to be freed, you can free them and not be responsible for them in their old age. So that was a quid pro quo. You, they get their freedom, you don't have to be responsible for them in their old age. So people across Connecticut rush to free people at that point because they had people approaching 45 years old when this law came out and they said, oh, I can, I can wash my hands of them. Now imagine being an enslaved person freed at 44 years old with just the clothes on your back. You have no house to live in. You have no <coughs> accumulated wealth, except for, I guess if you're Moses, and, and you're set free in a community that may or may not want you as a free person. So the law again protected the property owners gave some enslaved people their freedom, but we're not necessarily sure it was, there couldn't have been a better way of doing it. But with that, Jeffrey Mead went to the Greenwich Historical, Greenwich Town Clerk's Office, went into the records and pulled out all the enslaved people who had been freed, who show up in the property records. The reason they show up in the property records, because the enslaver, if that, if that, Former slave ends up in the poorhouse. The enslaver wants to be able to say, "Look, I'm not responsible for them anymore." So we see those records. We don't see, you know, Simsbury doesn't have as doesn't have the volume that we see so much of that, but we do see we have an emancipation that we do have here. But so you have all these other records, property records, probate records, wills, and inventories are are powerful. What people say in the wills versus what they do. Seeing enslaved people listed among things in a barn or, 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 or um, animals. Uh, livestock is, is super powerful for us to understand that it, it, with all the things that somebody might say about an enslaved person, they still show up as property with a, with a price tag on it. Um, vital records, church records, and we see, I'm gonna have you click on that last, on the birth of Hope of uh, Mortality. Let's see if this comes up. Never mind. <laughs> um, okay, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So, end of slavery and erasure, dis disremembering African American history. If slavery was critical to develop in our country, if slavery shaped the beliefs about race in our country, if slavery was the main cause of the Civil War, if the enslaved resisted their bonds and still contributed to the growth of our country, how can we remember and restore the history of the enslaved? Well, these are kind of questions. If these all are true, then what do we have to do? What is our job? So, thank you. Um, go ahead, next. So our project is, uh, and, and I'm gonna leave this um, slideshow. Okay, you have a PDF of it. So if somebody wants to grab a copy of the slideshow, you can do that. That's correct. Uh, but if um, our project is to restore the history, honor the humanity and contributions, research, enslavement, engage the citizenry and educate the students, you know, engaging the citizenry, we call it civic engagement. The new word is public history. Right now, I have an office, I have an office at Central Connecticut State University with the public history folks at, with the history department. They, this is what they want to do. Public history people, departments all over the country are starting to say, how do we get the history off the bookshelf and get it into people's hands? Um, in the middle, you see Hestone, if those of you who speak German, um, it says here, I think it says here lived Max Schwerner, was born in 1877, deported in 18, 1942 to 
Theresienstadt in 1944 to Auschwitz, where he was murdered. So that's what this project is, the, the inspiration of the project. And um, on the right is a stone for, for Pompeii. And we're now using a black lettering inside, so you can read it easier. But it says Pompeii, carpenter, enslaved here, circa 1775. So the one place we had this stone, we know uh, Pompeii was owned by four or five enslavers. They lived to be 90, so thinking out lived a bunch of them. And he was the last owned slave in Guilford. So we wanted to put that on the stone. If you look at the records, there are only three enslaved people left in the 1810 census, and there are none in the 1820 census, and he died in 1819. So, and he was part of this original family that we, we kind of have a family that sometimes we call it our Adam and Eve family. But on our board, the uh, chair of the board is Pompey's fifth, fifth great niece. Hmm. So she's, she's uh, so Pompey is part of this extended family that includes a Tuskegee Airman, Includes a preacher who died in Africa looking for homes for freed slaves, uh, a weather um, a, a weather prophet, Moses a king, and a lot of other people. But it's a great, you know, we have 11 generations of the story, and that's, that's part of it. Next slide, please. Uh, how do we remember? Well, we started by remembering why we had our first installation ceremony was really big in Guilford. All the eighth graders do this project every year now. And so you had, you know, well, 278 graders. The community came out. The day was nice. The next year was raining. So we, you know, we did it in the gym. But this was on the Guilford. If you've ever been to Guilford, we have an 80 degree surrounded by four churches and a hardware store. So it's really, you know, it looks like Norman Rockwell painting, but it was wonderful. But it's, you know, the, the next year was COVID. So we live streamed into the class. So each year is different. And we will see. But that's Montrose and Phyllis, who were purchased in, in Boston in 1727, brought to Guilford by a Scottish merchant. And, um, and again, our ninth gen, our, 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 um, our um, <coughs> uh, board chair is a ninth generation uh, descendant of Montrose and Phyllis. Go ahead, please. And we have the kids. That's a big part is we share documents with the kids and they use those documents to tell the stories. And um, and our my job so much of it is to find enough documentation so that the kids they don't you know we don't have enough days in the school year for the kids to do the research so we do the research take the documents transcribe them highlight the areas that are most accessible to the kids that the kids can grab information out and they tell the best story they can with that information. Go ahead. And that's our, our mission, research, education, civic engagement. But, um, in 2019, we're just two years into it. Um, we had an article in Teaching Tolerance Magazine, which was really cool. That's, uh, it, had, it renamed the organization now. Uh, it's, I forget what it's called. But, um, but it's part of the Southern Poverty Law Center's educational branch. So that was a big boon for us, and it gives us a, a legitimacy. And the picture, even though it says hard history in Guilford, that's a picture of West Hartford. So the West Hartford, they, the West Hartford folks have really taken the project and run with it. So they were our first kind of franchise of the project when we started. Go ahead. And this is this is kind of what we're trying to do in the classroom. Um, if you were a teacher, the idea of a jigsaw activity makes sense. We different groups of kids learn different parts of the story, and they share it with each other. So at the end, everybody knows the whole story. So we have these documents. We analyze them ourselves to see how the kids can extract information. We do it through these five themes, these recurring themes, dehumanization, treatment of enslaved, paternalism, economics of slavery and freedom, and human agency and resistance. And the most important is the human agency and resistance. If we sit here and talk about the victimization of enslaved people over and over again, we're in a sense re-victimizing them. So how do we break out of this telling a story that we have to get down into the mud first before we have to get down into that hole before we can kind of come up out of it. But we do that through looking at these different parts and then showing an enslaved person's, um, the decisions they're making or things that are happening that we only see happening to them because of the way that documents are, are described. And, but like for today, like with the kids in, in Sinsbury and, and for you all, 
we're telling the, the story of Peter Caesar. And in telling that story, he had to be an agent in his freedom. He might have to be an agent. He had to be somebody. Why did he get his freedom and so many other people didn't? Why did he get a good amount of land? Why did that happen? And I explained to the kids when I was teaching, I said, well, when you, you know, I'm mostly teaching like 13 year olds. And when you're old enough to drive a car and you go to your, your mom and say, mom, can I drive the car? Can I have the car for Friday night to bring my girlfriend to the Guilford Fair? Your mom's going to say, yes, but. <laughs> now, the but might be a really long list, right? It could be you play the role, put the laundry away, do the dishes or something like that. But in the kid, but when the when the, when when her son goes to the pick up his girlfriend to go to the Guilford Fair, he's gonna say, "Yeah, I got the car from my mom. Like I'm the I'm the actor. I'm the hero of this story. I, I made sure that this car was available for me, and my mom couldn't even argue about it. Well, he did everything his mom wanted him to do, but he did something too. So we have to understand that he was an agent in that story, and that the son." is gonna tell a different story than the mother tells that same night. <laughs> We're only hearing the mother's story here, aren't we? We're only hearing the story of the enslaver. But we know that, you know, Caesar, who became Peter Caesar, or who, you know, and he is listed as Peter Caesar Negro or Caesar Negro, but he did something to gain his freedom and his property. And that's what we have to wring out of these stories. We have to, it, because it's not sitting there waiting for us because you know, when someone tells a story, the, the enslaver tells a story, they're the hero of the story. We have to get and look from the other side. So we do that by assigning each group of kids one of these themes to look at various documents with, and then they use, they extract the information, and they tell each other how to get information from these documents. In a sense, they sharpen their tools, because what we want to do next is to tell the story about one person. We want to have the kids use those five themes to extract information about one person. And this happens to be your, from your neighbor. Uh, this is from Southfield, and this is Tamer. Um, and she was married to Sol uh, Venture Smith's son, Solomon. And this stone, we had to, we had to, um, we had to put aside because we got it wrong. <laughs> we, we kept doing research and we found other information. So we were trying to say, how did Tamer how did she show agency? Well, she was bought and sold a couple of times and she was finally sold to Venture Smith's son. And that's when she got her freedom, when she married Venture Smith. There's a few, you know, there's a few old stories where the women get their freedom from getting married too, depending how bad the parents are. But to continue that story, <laughs> what we found out is when we thought she died in, in 1810, she, she left the community she was in because she ran away from her husband. So we found a runaway ad <laughs> that looks just like a runaway ad for an enslaved person, but it's like, my, you know, my, my wife, Tamer, ran away from my bed, you know, or left, left my bed and is on her own and don't, don't give her any credit. So we like to say that Tamer showed her, her agency twice. <laughs> once, you know, once getting purchased and, and becoming a wife and second running away from her husband. So it's, uh, so these stories are complicated because, well, you know, and, and this is happening and we, we have Tamer in at least three locations and, and Suffield with the Loomis and the Smith family. And um, in East Ham, uh, East Haddam with the Venture Smith family and in, um, in Middletown. So she lived in all three of those places. We think we found a new marriage record too. So, <laughs> so she might get married again. But it's, the stories are very complicated. And sometimes we only can tell a part of the story with the kids because you could, you know, we have stories that start in Wallingford end up in Vermont by way of, Deerfield, Massachusetts. So we, we can only tell parts of these stories and we're hoping at some point we can engage students in Vermont and in Massachusetts in Wallingford, Connecticut to tell these longer stories. <laughs> and this is, uh, you know, this is sometimes we do these whole genealogies. Uh, this is a stone from Moses. It was the first stone we put in the ground. Of course, a little symbolism there, you know, Moses was the leader of his people. Well, he was the first stone we put in, you know, in Guilford, it happened to be in front of the town hall because two houses, two buildings before the town hall was the, uh, was where Reverend Fowler lived. And uh, his parents lived around the corner. His uh, sister and brothers lived a little further down the street. So it's a really neat story. And again, we have his, his uh, one of his nieces as part of the project. So that's really cool. Go ahead. Uh, you know, we're looking at themes of dehumanization and agency and resistance. We, we sort of, 
Yeah, we're not gonna, we're gonna, I'll, again, you guys have, um, Pastor George has a, uh, access to the PDF, so he'll share it with you. But, um, but go ahead. What is human agencies? When we started the project, people said, you know, why do you use the term agency? It's not really a common term. It is a common term in like in sociology. And, and you know, when you're counseling somebody, you, you know, whose decisions are being made. It's how one displays a desire to take control of the lives. Agency can come in the form of resistance and office. Also can be demonstrated through one's capacity to control their circumstances. Um, in, in enslaved people, sometimes we look for examples of refusing to work, sabotaging work, running away. These are all forms. So all these hundreds of runaway ads we have in Connecticut are all forms of agency. Other forms of agency might come in the form of working hard and earning money and gaining and purchasing one freedom or having children or surviving capacity. We're not here to judge if somebody does everything they're supposed to do and gets their freedom versus somebody who poisons their enslaver to get their freedom. We're not here to judge that. It's all of those are agency. Uh, we recently have been really trying to celebrate soldiers who fought in the American Revolution, but we were only celebrating one side. <laughs> there are many African Americans who fought on the side of the British because the British up front guaranteed them their freedom. It took a long time for the uh, revolutionaries to do that. So those, they were fighting for, they, their, their fight in the war, even if it was against America, was also their signs of agency. And again, I'm not here to judge if you're in captivity, whose side you fight on to get your freedom. That's not, that's not my first position to judge that. Let me go skip again, skip again. We're trying to get into the end. So this is one of the big documents we have for you all, the Emancipation of Peter Caesar Negro. It gives us a lot of information. It tells us who um, Andrew Roby purchased him from, uh, which is really cool. Uh, and um, <coughs> Aaron Pinney from uh, Windsor, he purchased him from. Of course, Windsor includes South Windsor and East Windsor. So it's, a, again, a big town. I'm trying to find Andrew Pinney. But it says about what age he was purchased at, so we can tell what age things happened later on because he was, and then it gets into other details. Um, and I love the, the terms like, uh, having kept in my service uh, this day now, do give him uh, my said servant, Peter Caesar Negro, his freedom of time from any service, allowing him from time to time, dead at all times, forever hereafter to act, uh, according to the law, fully his own in his own name and receive the profits of his own labor. Isn't that powerful? He gets to receive the profits of his own labor. Like to me, that's that that's it there. It even says it, but it, it really, you know, it gets into those things. And and then we have later on, and I have the transcription, so if you get the it should, it should work. Can you just click on the transcription real quick to make sure that link works? Yeah, yeah, excellent. Uh, again, if you were a middle school teacher, you're all set. But <laughs> what is the next slide? Uh, and then we have we have some other things about um, Peter that it's it's interesting because when Peter purchased the land, what we had next happen was a was that he some neighbors wrote a quick claim, which means that people who kind of felt that they might have had some rights to that land had to give that up for for caesar to uh, peter caesar to to have full control over it so that happened soon after and then peter caesar disappears from what we can find here and we don't find them in the um census we don't find them in the property records anymore so something happened afterwards and we're not sure but we do find that peter negro in um who fought in the war and also a peter caesar who fought in the war and one's in Hartford and the other one's in um, Southfield. I mean, yeah, Southfield. And they're not too far away. So we're not, we can't be sure that they are him, but they are, you know, we have to, with this project, oftentimes speculate what could have happened, what might have happened, why, if Peter Caesar gained a good amount of property, you know, what did he do? Was it probably the best thing for him to leave town? We know so many of these communities that were happy to have enslaved people weren't happy to have free blacks. I can't say that for Simba. I can't, I can't say, oh, look at what happened in Simba. I can tell you what happened in Canterbury. <laughs> I can tell you what happened in other towns in Connecticut, but we can't say that in Simba. And I, and I don't want to say that, I guess, uh, unless we have some record, but we know that when a lot of African-Americans happened in Durham, we, we have 
Caesar in Durham, who was a, a, a governor, and he, he gained all this property, and probably within five years, he's gone. And uh, the only example we have of an enslaved, I have, and I don't have, I don't have an ex exhaustive study, but I, I am going around the state, is in Killingly, this family of enslaved people were given 90 acres in a mansion house. So they were given a lot of stuff, which is fantastic. But in the, in the um, records, their enslaver, very paternalistic, but maybe had a point. He said, you cannot study that this family was uh, Cape, Demis, and Phyllis cannot sell their property without the permission of the first selectman. And that's the only place I saw a family of enslaved people keep land for like three generations. And I'm wondering if that was, it seemed paternalistic because it meant that they couldn't make their own decisions. But on the other hand, it might have meant that somebody couldn't come in and take it from them or cheat them or something like that. So we see when that happened, and I think around 1770, we could see that Demis lives all the way out to like the uh, 1830s and we see her children on the property. They're, they're not there today, but we can see that extension. And we wonder if that control didn't help them keep their property from people who promised them something or speculation or something else. So, it's, it's hard to see, but it, it, we'd love to know more about Peter. And maybe five years from now, while we're looking for other things, it'll, it'll drop in our lap. But that's is all we could find. And so this is, you know, in showing agency sometimes is through, you know, just like so many of us, our grandparents, you know, my grandparents came from, you know, French Canada without an eighth grade education and their kids got a high school education and their grandkids, most of us went to college. Well, we see that maybe Montrose and Phyllis, we know Montrose and Phyllis and Guilford worked hard and they inherited property. And that property went through the family. And then, you know, eight generations later, their sons, uh, you know, went to college, their grandson, great grandson went to college and became a Tuskegee Airman. Their granddaughter was a state representative and commissioner of social services here in Connecticut. And uh, her son is, uh, Cheo Hodari Coker, who is a screenwriter, and he did the Luke Cage series for Netflix. He's like this big, you know, big, big uh, writer and producer on the West Coast. And her, her sister is a uh, Valerie Wilson Wesley, who writes uh, uh, novels and and and, uh, and mysteries. So, so it's a, it's this really exciting family for us to be connected with. But it shows that. We can't, not every generation is able to show a highest level of achievement, but there is a path in many families if we can, if we can find them. This is not where we are today. By the end of this school year, we'll be over 7,000 students, probably closer to 7,800 students. Uh, we're really uh, stretching out across Connecticut and uh, mostly we're asked in by teachers, teachers or curriculum people. And sometimes churches will say, you know, how can we do the project in our community? Recently, uh, the deacon at the Episcopal Church in um, Essex called us in to work with, with the churches and the historic societies and we bring in the school in there. In Wilton, I think we'll be working with five different churches. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's pretty amazing. So we, we can see the church is the way we, it, it isn't, you know, we, we, we do, you know, I'm a teacher, so I love teaching the teachers and bringing it to the kids, but we, this, this works too. And, uh, but we have a, a few projects that will, you know, probably by the end of next month, we'll fill in the map more. And, uh, but that's, this is something to me, it's very exciting <laughs> to be able to do that. Is there another slide after that? Okay. Um, and this is our learning outcomes is <clears throat> the kids become consumers and producers of information and literacy. They collaborate, communicate with each other, local historians, teachers, and researchers, present individual share understandings and build the foundation to discuss hard history on a path towards truth and reconciliation. Uh, we've been getting a lot of uh, people interested in us as part of um, reparations or redress or restitutions. And, and we talk about that in a, in a way to say, in, when I say, what, this is what we're doing, I don't know what you, you can, in a sense, label it how you, how you want, but the idea that, that in our country, you know, I, I had the, the privilege of going to South Africa a few years ago, and you could see what they do did on, around truth and reconciliation. And you could see what's happened in Germany with the Stolperstein. You could see in other parts of the world. 
And we really haven't got to the truth part yet in our country. And, and I grew up in Massachusetts saying the South had slavery, the South, therefore the South is racist, therefore the South has segregation, therefore the South has a problem to solve. And what if slavery happened here? And what if racism is here? And what if segregation is here? How do we solve those problems? And we don't have to engage the students with those questions right now, but we can start with them understanding the truth of what happened here and for them to understand it. kids hate injustice. Kids, if, if, you, if you give one student a lollipop for getting an A and the other student you give a pencil, they're gonna get upset. Someone's gonna get upset. But they don't like it. They don't like seeing an enslaved child being sold from her mother. They don't like seeing enslaved people being listed with livestock. That bothers them. It doesn't, you don't have to, you don't have to give them your opinion. You don't have to editorialize. They just don't like it. And if we can teach history in a way that people say this is wrong, then it really <laughs> then it helps them when they go to the next place and say, oh, that's wrong too. And that's wrong. But we don't have to do the whole thing. We can just, in a sense, keep in our in what we're doing. But it, it does, I feel it becomes important because I feel maybe I would have made different decisions if I knew this when I was their age. And and maybe if we can, you know, and one of the things I love about being with Central is instead of teaching teachers who have graduated from college, maybe we can start teaching teachers as they go through college and we can start reaching them there. So we're, we're really trying to, you know, hit, hit the teachers where they are, get them in college and then, then reach the students too. But that's, you know, that's mainly what the, um, what the project's about. Um, I think you see that slide a little old. It says Senator Kamala Harris, of course, she's the vice president now, but there's no vaccine for racism. We have to do the hard work. I know your church is working on that and, 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 and that's wonderful. And, and there's so many communities that are trying to embrace this while dealing with, you know, people screaming about, you know, we shouldn't be teaching things that make us feel bad. Yeah, I can't understand why my teacher taught me about the, you know, <laughs> Japanese internment camps, Sacramento Benzetta, um, Trail of Tears. Yeah, I was taught all those things, you know, Diary of Anne Frank. We were taught all those things that we survived. It. And why we can't teach this next part is uh, seems to be something else. But I think that's it for the slideshow. This, I'm sure there's some questions, or is, are there any questions you might have? I do. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, um, maybe just ask you to, to, to comment. So I know when uh, we were talking about Peter Caesar and, and saying that he was enslaved by Andrew Roby, a prominent member here. And I think I said something like, oh, so Andrew Roby was one of the good guys in effect. And, and, and I think your response was, you know, the equivalent of yes, and. I mean, you said that, that um, Andrew Roby benefited from the enslaved labor of Peter Caesar, that he enriched himself um, through the benefit of Peter Caesar, through Peter Caesar. So even though he ultimately freed him, um, he still benefited from that enslaved labor. And it relates back to the church because Andrew Roby is known in our history books for donating land for this church. So therefore, the land that Andrew Roby donated was accumulated in part the, by Peter Caesar's well, swipe tears, labor, so, yeah. enslaved labor. So yeah, it's a hard, you know, what, again, we don't, you know, in, in Guilford, there's hundreds of houses that have a nice house plaque on them tell you who built the house. And we're not, we don't want to go around with a crowbar and tear those off. But we do want to remember the other folks. And I think, you know, when, when we're at the Bush Holly house, they were talking about how this guy was like an entrepreneur. He had his own vessel because the Bush Holly house is in, in uh, Cost Cobb is right on the right on the river going out to the Long Island Sound. He had his own vessel, he had his own mill. He was he was making some real money. When you find out he had 15 enslaved people working, not working, but he owned who were working and helping him accumulate wealth, then you realize that he didn't do it all himself. And that's where it, it, it's it's like, you know, uh, I was just my, my granddaughter was reading, she's six years old and reading a book about how Thomas Jefferson and, and John Adams were, you know, they loved each other and hated each other and loved each other. So it's, it's a great book about how we can get along with people, even if we don't agree with them. I think that's, that's just like the best lesson for today ever, right? Mm -hmm. But it talks about the wealth that Thomas Jefferson had versus, you know, John Adams, who wasn't the poorest guy in town, but he didn't have a 
hundred something people or two hundred something people helping him accumulate wealth. And so Andrew Roby, for him to get that wealthy, two things were happening. One is he had enslaved people working or he owned that were working for him. And second, he was filling vessels, probably helping to fill vessels to send to the West Indies and, and, and benefiting from their labor too. And that's, you know, in, in, in New Haven, which became a center of the abolitionist movement, the, one of the biggest industries was building these beautiful, fancy carriages and sending them south to the, you know, to the plantation owners. So, you know, in, in Lowell, another Lowell, Massachusetts, center of, of slavery, of, of uh, anti-slavery movements, had these mills, miles of brick mills that were buying cheap cotton from the south and turning it into slave cloth. You know, it's when we say, we, you know, speaketh, speaketh out both sides of our mouths. <laughs> <laughs> and what is it good that Andrew Ruby freedom? Right. Yes, it is. Is it good that he, you know, he saw his, you know, uh, that he, you know, we could say he converted, right? It, it is wonderful. And in the story of Montrose and Phyllis, um, David Naughty owned them for only 10 years. And he decided at the death of his wife, they're not only going to free him, he's going to give him a house, give him land and give him an annuity. So he, he got converted somehow. And uh, we have some negative somehows, like, like Pat Wilson Phineas will say, she did her DNA test and found out she was part Scottish. You know, so that might be a somehow that the children of, 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 of Phyllis might be related to, you know, Mr. Naughty, but he, he turned. Now his wife, when she it was time for her to free the enslaved people, she decided not to. Was that <laughs> retribution? You know, we look at the story, but, but you can see that there are people who may be coming in contact with other human beings who have been dehumanized and say, gosh, Peter's a he's like me, you know, he starts to relate to Peter and, and, uh, and, and Israel Proctor and, and killingly frees this family and gives them 90 acres in a mansion house along this uh, beautiful stream, uh, Whetstone Brook. And maybe he started to say, they, you know, they're, they're like me, they're, we, we, you know, we're the, we're the same. And why am I, you know, why do I have this advantage over them? So, we can see people doing that. We also see that they're doing it at their death. So they wrung out as much <laughs> well from that person before they so there's a lot of, there's a lot of. So, so you talked about the erasure of enslaved people. It could also go the other way. So so and Andrew Roby's name is on our plan giving society. Yeah. The Andrew, and because he was the first one to donate substantially to the church. So that's the connection that's made there. And and it's like we haven't even had this conversation yet, but oh my gosh, do we take his name off? But I think there's a case to be made to leave his name on. Because then, then yeah, yeah, and you talk about you, it. And then, and then when you click on the Andrew Roby, maybe there's a little discussion about uh, Peter Caesar or something. And it's, Be that it's that it's complicated. Because if you yeah, if you take it away, then the discussion isn't there, and it is complicated. And um, it's James Morris talks about after he gains his freedom, he goes back to his last enslaver and 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 really um, does hospice for him. He like takes care of him in his death, and you're like, "Oh crap!" <laughs> but but they're humans, you know. Mm -hmm. you, they're humans, and and that's that's what you know. And, and James Morris, if you can click, you can go online and find his autobiography. It's it's wonderful. Uh, but that's what he does, you know. He 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 goes back and takes care of him as he's dying, and thinks nothing. You know, in a sense, thinks nothing. Like that's this is what people. This is how people treat each other. It's kind of how he was at. But he's also the guy that moved to Massachusetts so he could vote because the vote for African. Americans was taken away in 1818, so he wanted to vote, so he crossed the border. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, he, 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 he moved to Massachusetts so he could vote. So he has, you know, he wasn't like he was a softy. He was just like, no, this is, this is something, as a human, I want to do to another human. So. Are there any other stories of connections with churches, the Litchfield Church, for example, where a stone has been placed and there was a the connection is... Well, the, the closest connection to this one is uh, in Killingly. Out, just a little side piece. I don't know how you have to be a Killingly lose here. Killingly was a town that their uh, school mascot was the, the Redmen, and the Board of Education and the students said, "Oh, we got to change it," so they changed it to the Red Hawks. And then the Board of Education got voted out for that particular reason, and they came in and they changed it back to Redmen. So this is Killingly. In the meantime, <laughs> the teachers come to me and say, can we do the project? And some people say, why would you want to do it in Killingly? I said, because the teachers want to do it. Right? And the kids want to do it. So we brought the project to Killingly. 
uh, Westfield Congregational Church, which is really the Killingly included Putnam and Danielson. So the old Killingly Church is really in Putnam. Westfield Church was founded by the Danielson family, which is the village of Danielson, which is a Killingly's named after. <clears throat> when we went there, I was talking to the preacher uh, about the project, and he said, um, oh, I have a communion cup by Mary Danielson. And I said, oh, I have, a, I have an account book that says Mary Danielson went to, <laughs> went to uh, Boston and bought cuff. And so they was like, oh crap, like, <laughs> like, like literally the wealth of our church was founded off of the wealth of this Danielson family who was our biggest supporter. And we even have extant this communion cup that was bought by Mary Danielson. And the church. So yes, it's saying, you know, the same thing we have, Middletown Congregational Church, there's 150 enslaved people recorded as being baptized or owning the covenant or excommunicated or buried or something like that. Um, and there's other towns that have as many around Connecticut. But have any of those churches participated in the Witness Room project? <laughs> Westfield has, Norfolk has, um, um, Lyme, Old Lyme has. Congregational churches are it's kind of our most common partner outside of the schools. And now the Episcopal churches are, the Episcopal Diocese of Connecticut or Hartford, which includes Connecticut, uh, has, has granted $20,000 for multiple churches to do the project for us. Where I'm going with this is, as you heard, we aren't quite sure yet what we're gonna do with the stone. Yeah. Where, where, where would it be best displayed to, to highlight the connection? And I'm looking to- Yeah, I, 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 you know, I like the concept, um, uh, the German concept, which is Stolpelstein, <laughs> stumbling stone, is a place where people will surprisingly see it. Um, in Guilford, we have it in front of the Catholic Church because two houses before that was a Thomas Pynchon who held West Joachim in captivity. So I think, uh, you know, I what I don't, what I prefer not is it's not behind something, it's not behind a mailbox or you know, behind something. I wanted a place where people are going to be surprised when they see it, but they'll see it because it's an entryway or a, a common way. Uh, I also prefer it not to be hit by a plow, so <laughs> that's a bad thing. But the one in front of the town hall in Guilford is literally like you, if you're centered on the front door, it's there right between where the sidewalk turns to brick walk, and it gets beat up. But I go there and polish it, and and you know, and uh. Old, if you were in the Navy, you probably are still have that brasso, <laughs> brasso thing, and that's why you polish it with brasso. But that, I, you know, I like the idea of stumbling over it, and that's what we're, you know, and, and the more public, the better. You know, looking at your church because you're kind of up a fall, you know, some, at some ways you say, oh, it'd be really neat down by the sidewalk. But it might be really neat by one of your entrances too. And that's where um, one of the slides is. Um, so if you want to, I think you go, I think you just go back one slide. And one of the slides um, for the Congregational Church in Madison, uh, we use the stone right here. So if you're walking up to the, so if you know Madison is like Route one and then there's like a, a green and behind the green is the church. If you're walking up to the church, the stones are right here. So you, you kind of have to go right to left and then the stones right to the left. So I, you know, um, but people, you know, at the, at the Bush Holly House, they really didn't have a great place. So they're kind of making a garden in the back where they have multiple stones. They're going to try to do all 15 Witness Stone memorials there. Uh, this will be putting in our sixth stone this year. I wasn't, um, I understand there was a conversation at our trustees meeting that I wasn't able to attend, but the idea of um, maybe having a little explanatory piece with it, and then also maybe with a QR code that somebody would then sort of, you know, sort of scan, and it would take them to something more. Yeah, well, you can, you know, certainly grab the documents we have, and but um, I think that's a um, in the project we're doing with the Southbrook Southwest African American Museum in New Jersey. Um, they're trying to figure out something like that, so they're even thinking of just like a like a four by four post or you know something like that that comes up and on it you can. Put a QR code so when someone sees it they'll say oh what, what is this and then I see the QR code sitting there um in old line they have a like you have along the you know canal and stuff like one of those um 
something you see at the national park, mm -hmm. like one of those things, and, and they have that, but they have like a dozen stones in a line. So they're really, but they have the QR code because when they add more stones, you, you can always put more, you know, you can always put more in the cloud, right? Clouds are plenty of room. <laughs> <laughs> we say that now, but that's yeah. something. <laughs> For, yes. So are you going to write a book? <laughs> Collect a bunch of these stories. And... I, you know what we're working on now. For the young person here, no. <laughs> uh, we're working on podcasts right now to, to try to tell stories, like maybe like a you know do like six or eight episodes a year to try to bring the stories in, and then we, we're 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 really running into some wonderful people, uh, Joe, Joe McGill. Who does a slave dwelling project around the country? He's, you know, we're starting to partner with him. We're getting some great people who have good stories. I, so I'm going to tell you my long term goal. I'm hoping to be in charge of this for like three or four more years and then make it so somebody else could be in charge of it because I don't want it to die with me, I guess is a nice way of saying it. And then probably by about seven years, I'm hoping to like retire from it. And then that's when I would have time to write a book. But right now, yeah. I don't, I don't, I'll say, you know, I'm averaging about, you know, 12 hour days mm -hmm. um, until the end of the school year Then I'm gonna have some time off because we're, we're really zooming in. And we, we, I think we were at 10 or 12 schools up to last year and now we're 10 more. And we're trying to hire people to, and, and this is during COVID. We've grown so much during COVID. It's a little scary and there's nobody else doing anything like this, like anywhere. There's no one else doing the story of slavery in your town. That's the real trick. And that's the heavy lifting. Uh, you know, it, it, if I could tell you, I, doing the story here was harder than doing, you know, many stories elsewhere because you don't have that depth of slavery that I, even a Suffield had, you know, you don't, you don't have it. It was, you were just enough off the beaten path that it was left, but you know, you, you, I'm shocked that Colchester, I think in the 1790 census, Colchester had the most enslaved people. Mm -hmm. And Lebanon was very close to that. So, and you're like, why Colchester, right? Why Colchester? But they were growing the stuff that was most needed, you know, elsewhere. They were growing those crops. Some of the stuff you guys did here was also for the you know, domestic market. Like, I think you guys had a big, what do you call it? Burning yeah. trees to make Tobacco. gold. Oh, oh, charcoal. charcoal. Yeah, yeah, I think you guys have like a big charcoal industry. That's great, but that's not getting, you know, that's probably not getting shipped to the West Indies. Well, some of it might be, but even like I'm working in Suff Suffield and, you know, and um, I got a call from the preacher in uh, Enfield. It's, a, it's like night and day, the amount of <laughs> records that you find in Enfield versus Suffield, because Enfield was settled later. It was, hadn't already been cleared by the Indians, so they, it was really a lot of just heavy duty lumber that was being done there. And that seemed not to, to be more, you know, domestic help. But again, you go to some, it just, it surprises me where you go when you say, oh, in, in Killingly, across the river in Brooklyn, there was a whole plantation and with a crazy story where the enslaver didn't want to pay his dues to the, his taxes to the congregational church because he was, because he was, so what he did, he was from Newport. He had his slaves build a Episcopal or Anglican church. And then he, then he asked the state to, that he could pay his taxes to the Anglican church. So he was, <laughs> so, but that's a crazy story. Sitting, like sitting right there in, you know, in, in Brooklyn, you go to Brooklyn, Connecticut, like there's, there's no there there. And, but, they have, but they have one of the better stories in Connecticut. So, and I don't know, you know, I, and I don't know until I get there because I can't, you know, I can't be looking everywhere. I have to, I have to really be focused on where I'm working but uh, I'm up in Woodstock and they had a praying I didn't know they had a praying village in Woodstock mm -hmm. with John Elliott you know starting that so that's a whole other thing with the tribal members and stuff mm -hmm. like that so yes you referred to me how many how many of you are there and <laughs> what you said you you hired people so tell well right now it's you know I, so I started out when I retired from teaching I started not being unpaid but it was, it was like my curriculum, I came up with a name and everything else. I worked with a great committee in Guilford, but they, when it came time to leave Guilford, they were, they were pulling. And I said, you know, if you, if you have a good idea, you got to share it. So I'm getting paid full time. We have a half time employee. I have a pretty active board, but there's not a lot of people doing the stuff. So the hard thing for me right now is all the research, all the document analysis, all the 
document preparation for the schools and all the inquiries. We get lots and lots of inquiries. So probably one out of, you know, it's not, it's not like a salesman, right? <laughs> one out of 20 inquiries, it leads to something, but then people come back. So if somebody was like, who, who inquired a couple of years ago, comes back and says, well, let's do, you know, let's figure out a way to do this. So you don't want to push that away. But, so we're trying to, so we're going from, you know, I'd say 1.5 FTE to <laughs> two full-time people and a graduate assistant through a central. We're trying to, they're, they're a lot cheaper, trying to get a couple graduate assistants so we can have them either on a regular basis and then um, hire somebody else. We're looking at, you know, we're looking at some of the bigger funders to see if they like our ideas too and they're going to fund it. So it's, uh, it, but it's hard when you're, you know, you, we're, we're small, we have a big footprint. <laughs> But we're a small organization, but that's where Central helps because if somebody comes in and says, "Oh, here we have X amount of money for you," then Central can manage it. I don't, you know, my goal in life is not to have a witness stones office tower. <laughs> it's really to have a few of us doing the work and other people. You know, the, the grant administrators at Central can administer the grants, and they, these people can do that. So that's what we're in. And we have pro bono partnership out of Hartford that's doing all our legal stuff. And God bless them because that's you know tens of thousands of dollars worth of stuff that they do for free, yeah. um, and so we're, so we're trying to be as lean as we can and keep focus on the teachers and the students. And I think if we do that and not get too far off our mission, we'll, we'll be okay. I think when you see it, good. <laughs> after the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a. Well, we, we, we have, yeah, we know it is, we're very rich with content and, and that's where, that's where the podcast makes sense. You know, when people say, well, you know, what do you have? And it's like, we have all the content in the world. So really it's about, um, even individual communities like Guilford's going to be doing their like 12 stone when they do the 15 stone, they should put a book together with all the stories of slavery and Guilford, right? Yeah. And uh, that we have fleshed out so far. And, and that's what they've done in Germany with some of the towns where they've done the Strockelstein. They have booklets or web pages just on that. So, but we're also letting each community do their own stuff as much as possible without diluting what we're doing. So um, the West Harbor people are doing wonderful work, but they, they, they can't leave West Harbor. That's the rule. They, they have to work within West Harbor. But they have three people. <laughs> Three retired teachers working really hard on it, and they've got some real progress in it. What about the CPTV? You ain't seen that. Uh, good. I'm going to be on the radio. I've, I've been on um, the wonderful program <laughs> where, where we live um, oh, yeah. on uh, uh, WNPR. I'm doing something, I think, next week in, in, um, for Fairfield County. But yeah, you know, any, any press is good press, and what we find is you know, we get a little something from each thing we do, you know, and, um, but we are getting, you know, we're getting in conversations that might help us with some bigger funding in the future, uh, where, you know, like I was interviewed by a researcher for the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, which I didn't know there was such, I heard of Rockefeller Foundation, but there's this Brothers Fund. And I said, well, where'd you get our name? Well, two or three people mentioned you guys. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, but I, you know, but, but I don't have too much time to, you know, pursue stuff because I still am worried about the project we have in New Haven with the two last women who were auctioned off on the New Haven Green in 1825 who were from Canada. So it's like another, you know, another great story. So I'm, I'm focusing, and we have researchers in New Haven that's helping us. So I'm focusing on that, and that's what I'm more, I'm more worried about that than you know. Than, Do you get pushback? We get pushback. Um, Guilford probably had the most the toughest um, board of ed election this year. Mm -hmm. It like made national news, mm -hmm. literally. And, and what happened in Guilford is a third party group and mm -hmm. the people who were running were, were wiped out. They, the people who were running on the anti-critical uh, uh, race theory ticket were, were swept out. But, you know, our goal is to reach every student. So we don't wanna, we don't want to go too bad, too far in one direction or the other, where people say, "I don't want my student doing that project." So, I think it's. I think if we sell it as good history, knowing that good history leads to, you know, good knowledge of the past leads to good things in the future, uh, I think we're going to be okay. But we have, we get pulled in different directions where people want us to say certain certain things, and we're like, 
I, and I always remember being an eighth grade public school teacher where you, if you want to keep, you know, if you want to keep your job, if you want to have, you know, you, you have to find the right way to do things and you can do it. It's, it's a little hard, but it, it's, it's working so far. And um, even though we were called out by name in Guilford on both sides, the superintendent's like, well, we're doing the witness zones project. It's like, <laughs> but the other side would say, well, that's the type of thing. But recently, I'll, I'll share this tidbit. Recently, at a, the, one of the elementary schools, the PTA, wanted to do a, like a scavenger hunt around the Gilbert Green. And we had these stones there. And one of the mothers said, wouldn't it be really cool for the kids? You know, they used to do gravestone rubbing. Mm -hmm. We'll do a rubbing of a witness stone. And one of the mothers said, well, I don't think we should be doing this. And I don't want my student involved with it. Well, another mother said, well, I don't want my kid involved. We're not doing it. We need to tell everybody's history. So let that discussion happen, you know, and let them deal with it. You know, so that's, that's, that's kind of what we're, where, where we're at. I want to thank Dennis. I, and I'm not rushing you off and, and people can linger if you have time to answer, answer more questions, but I also want to like, give permission for those who might need to, to go. So, sure. um, but, but um, wow, thank you so much. Be here all day, and I think many of us could be here all day with you, just listening to your story. So it's um, really yeah, that's, that's the way it is with a calling. Yeah, that's right. Wow, that's uh, yeah. That's, well, it's, it's funny because I, I see when I do the online ones that people like, I'm like, oh, that person's there again, <laughs> and I'm just wondering if I'm contradicting myself. In the <laughs> but it is, you know, it is, it is neat, and um, and we, we, you know, and it feels like we're at a tipping point, which is a kind of a wonderful, but also kind of a scary place. Because, but, but Central is really trying, they're even trying to get a professor that could be uh, partially assigned to the project. Oh. And that gives us a louder voice in the grant, you know, grant stuff. So it's, it's, it's and that's, that's a world I'm not as familiar with. So it's great stuff. But anyway, really great stuff. Congratulations. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Of course. Were there many people watching? 